you would open your Bible with me tonight to the book of Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. And we're taking a, uh, a look at the life of Jacob. We're taking a look at the life of Jacob, learning important lessons there on what it means to trust God. What does it mean to trust God, to obey the Lord, to step out in faith? Because here, after having served and lived with his father-in-law Laban for 20 years, served him for 14 years, now uh, here Jacob is called to leave Laban and to go back to the land of promise. God has now given him children through both of his wives, both Rachel and Leah. And now on his way out, there was a now event that took place where Laban now chased Jacob. And they had to put a barrier or a pillar, a memorial there, so that they would not cross that limit and not hurt one another. But here Jacob is still learning important lessons as to what it means to follow God. Important lessons as to what it means to follow the Lord, to hear his voice, and to truly follow him. Now notice, one of the lessons that he's learning here is that God does not exist to please you. You exist to please God. That is the message there. I think so many times we hear messages that God exists to please you. The message always revolves around you. I'll, I'll tell you this. The message does not revolve around you. The message revolves around God. And we exist to please God alone. In fact, I heard a quote that read this way, happy are those whose greatest desires are to do what God requires. Happy are those whose greatest desires are to do what God requires requires God is requiring something of Jacob he's requiring his absolute surrender and that's what we titled the message tonight absolute surrender you can write that down as a title of tonight absolute surrender this is the time where God gets a hold of Jacob's life again and the way that he gets a hold of Jacob's life is the same way that he gets a hold of our lives very daily and oftentimes the way that God does that is that he has to interrupt our day. He has to have a divine appointment, intervention, intervene. And sometimes he even has to discipline us because he loves us. And here he's dealing with the resistance of Jacob's life. That, that Jacob is obeying, but he's still resisting. That he is doing the will of God, but he still has an attitude problem. He's still struggling with his pride, Jacob, as he's following the Lord. We all know in Hebrews 12, 6, we've heard it many times over again, that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. If he loves you, he will discipline you. If he loves you, he will stop you. If he loves you, he will hinder you. If he loves you, he will close the door as well. He, he will make sure, notice his word says, he scourges every son whom he receives. That means that if we belong to him, we will experience the discipline of God as a way of training us to grow in him. Now know that. That's what the chastening of God sounds like. That's what it looks like. It is discipline that leads or is used as training in your life. So as painful as it feels, as uncomfortable as you would think that it is in your life, I want you to know that chastening, that discipline is training that God is using because he requires of you absolute surrender. And here, what's happening is that Jacob is out of the land of promise. He's heading back into the land of Canaan. And he's out of the land of promise, but he's not out of the hand of promise. What does that mean? God's hand of covering of protection was upon him. And we see no matter what event took place, regardless of who opposed him, how many times he failed, God's hand of protection was upon him. He still had a lot to learn. He needed to learn to surrender. Just because God is using him, just because God is blessing him, doesn't mean that he knew everything. And I want you to know that even right now, maybe God is using your life. Maybe he's blessing you right now. Just because he's blessing you, just because he's using you, doesn't mean that you know everything. 
It doesn't mean that you don't need God anymore. You can become independent because you know what you're doing. Know this, without God, we don't know what we're doing. We need God. We need Jesus. We need to abide in him. We need to depend on him. Jesus said in John 15, abide in me because without me, you can do nothing. And you know what Jacob is learning here? That without God, he can do nothing. He has to learn to depend upon God. He had areas in his life that were not yet fully surrendered. I want to ask you tonight, what areas in your life are yet not fully surrendered? What areas do you have a reservation sign there that you would say, God, you can touch everything in my life except this place? Because here he's going to learn that he has to give up that which he's leaning on so that he can lean on God. And you know what he was, what the problem was here with Jacob? He was very self-willed. He was strong-willed. He was prideful. It was his way or it was the highway. He thought that he can figure everything out. He thought that, you know, his plans always worked or superseded. In fact, you know what you see out of the pride of Jacob is that also came stubbornness. When you're proudful, you know what you are without realizing oftentimes? You become very stubborn. And everyone else is wrong, and you're the only one that's right. And when you're proudful, you become stubborn. And when you become stubborn, notice what happens after that. You become reckless. So what Jacob is learning here is that he needed to humble himself. He needed a little bit of a humble pie. <laughs> How many times do we need some of that? To know that we're not all that, that we don't know everything. Then we need to maybe be quick to listen and slow to speak. Don't become proudful. Don't become stubborn. Do not become reckless because God is using your life. Slow down. You know what he's doing here? God is doing to Jacob. He is slowing him down. And God will do whatever he needs to to slow you down. In James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, but he gives more grace. God gives more grace. He always has it available. What does he have available? More grace. He always gives more grace, no matter how much we fail. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. He will resist. He will detest. He will say, get away from me. You're proudful. You're arrogant. You're stubborn. You're rebellious. But he gives grace to the humble. You want God to receive you, to take you in? that you would hear his voice. You know what he, who he gives grace to? He gives more grace and then more grace and then more grace to those who humble themselves before him. To those that don't pretend to be something that they're not. In the presence of God, we need to learn to humble ourselves. And notice what happens here in verse 1 of chapter 32. Because now he's going back. He's obeying God. But he still has a lot to learn. He's journeying with the Lord, but he still has a lot to learn. And notice what happens here. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. You see here that he's beholding from verses 1 through 8. That Jacob went on his way. This is the preparation of what God is doing as he is taking steps of faith back to the land of Canaan, back to the promised land. He's stepping out in faith. He's stepping out in obedience. But what happens here is that the angels of God then meet him. It's amazing here because we see even in verse 1 that God meets us right where we are. That no matter where we are journeying in faith, regardless of where we go, if we're obedient in faith, what does it say here? That God's angels met him. Why? Because he was following the Lord in obedience. And there he has now affirmation. There he has a divine intervention. That God's angels or God's presence is encamping around him. It's amazing when you follow the Lord, you see that you are not alone, that he is with you. And notice there as we continue reading verse 2, when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. He was aware of God's presence. He was aware that those were God's angels. And he was as, as he was following the Lord in obedience, he said, this is 
God's camp, and he called the name of the place Mahanam. What does it mean? God's camp. Or that word means two hosts. He saw that there were two hosts or two groups of angels that were encamped around his family's camp. You know what kind of reminder this was there, even in verse 2 for Jacob? That God's will will be done on earth. He was going, he was proceeding, he was obeying, he was taking steps to faith, and God meets him there and surrounds him with protection. God is going to protect him as he returns home. And how does God protect him? By sending now two hosts of angels. Even as we pray for these two groups that were here just now, we know that God's going to protect them, and then he also is going to send angels to encamp around them. Amen? Oftentimes, we don't know, but God sends angels to guard, to protect his church. We, we don't like to talk about them, and Billy Graham once said that angels are God's special agents. He sends them out on special assignments to protect his people. Oftentimes, we don't notice that we interact with angels. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, verse 2, don't forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. The next time you see that there was a person in need, a stranger, don't just pass by. You, don't, you may be interacting with an angel there. <laughs> and that's what the Word of God tells us. But God is keeping his promise here. I want you to notice that in verse 2, that he will be with Jacob wherever he goes. This is a display of God's care for Jacob. In fact, you can put that down, not only protection, but also here provision of God's care. He's reminding him, Jacob, you're not traveling alone. Now, do you see when this revelation comes to Jacob? This comes after he separates himself from a worldly man. Do you notice that after you separate yourself from an unequally yoked relationship, then God can show you, then God can speak to you, then God can give a greater insight into your life as a Christian? When you separate yourself from the world, from a worldly person, from the world, then it brings a greater insight to your life as a Christian man and woman. Here he's going from salvation to sanctification. He's being renewed. He's being made holy. He's being made sanctified now. And notice how the preparation and the protection in Jacob's life continues because it says here in verse 3, then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir to the country of Edom. He sends his messengers before him to meet Esau. And he commanded them saying, speak thus to my Lord Esau, thus your servant Jacob says. I have dwelt with Laban, I have stayed with him until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female servants, and I have sent them to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. There you see Jacob doing what Jacob does best. He sends messengers, and he approaches his brother through those messengers in a, in a humble way. He said, go and tell my Lord that your servant is on his way. And tell him that I'm blessed with the possessions, that, that tell him that I'm coming, and I'm not asking for anything from him, that, that I have now possessions, and I've been with Laban, and notice what he says, I have oxen and donkeys and, and flocks and male and female servants. And I'm telling you this because I want to find favor in your sight. I want to find grace in your sight. Notice there at the end of verse 5, that I may find favor or grace in your sight. Now, it's important for us to know that, that grace is not earned by your performance. Favor from God is not earned by your works. Favor from God is not earned by your possessions, by your status, by your wealth, by your accomplishments. And here he's trying to earn favor through accomplishment. He's saying, look at everything I have. May I earn favor in your sight? I want you to know something, even as we sang that song, God, you're so good. God is not good to us because we bring gifts to him. 
God's good to us because of his gift to us, and that gift, his name is Jesus. That's why he's good to us. If we, if we had to work for favor, then grace wouldn't be a free gift. Grace is a free gift because it is not deserved and it cannot be earned. But what do you see here most importantly in those few verses that Jacob was leaning on his own understanding? I'm going to go back home and this is how I'll make things right. I'm going to send messengers and I'm going to tell my brother that I have so much as possessions. He was using the human wisdom instead of trusting in the Lord. He was trusting in his resources as if it all depended upon him do you see here there him now telling his messengers to tell his brother let him know how much i have trusting in his resources as if it all depended upon him what is he leaning on his resources who is he not depending upon the lord here you see instead of remembering the vision of god's angels and armies that were surrounding him and trusting the lord to see him through it he then tried to scheme to find a plan as to how i'm going to find safety who are we to look to when we are afraid the lord where are we to trust in trust in the lord in psalms 56 verse 3 would you note this tonight psalm 56 verse 3 the psalmist says whenever i'm afraid I trust you. Whenever I'm afraid, I trust you. David knew what that meant. He was running away from Saul. And here Jacob was afraid of his brother. He thought that his brother was his enemy. But you know who the problem was? The problem wasn't Esau. The problem of Jacob was Jacob. <laughs> that he wasn't depending upon the Lord. He wasn't leaning on the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2, it reads this way. Behold, God is my salvation. Remember that. The word salvation means deliverance. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He has also become my salvation. God is my salvation. I'm not afraid. I'm going to trust in Him. I'm going to lean on Him. I'm going to depend on Him. I'm going to wait on Him. You truly know if you are depending and trusting in God, if you're willing to wait on Him. And here notice he has a plan and he begins to plot. It goes from the preparation here that you see here to the protection of God's hand upon him by giving him a revelation of those angels' armies and then by the plotting here that comes next from verses 6 through 8. Because what happens here is then the messengers return to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he also is coming to meet you. And he has 400 men that are with him. You know what happens here to Jacob? He has his eyes on his brother. He has his eyes on that number, 400. <laughs> has God ever called you to do something and you think of a number, you think of a, how impossible it is? How you cannot meet that need? You know here who he's learning to depend on, not on numbers, not on resources, not on his own strength, but on God's strength. He said, your brother is coming. And there's 400 men that are coming to meet you with and it says here these next words that we have to really look at in that verse verse 6 because it says here they're coming to meet with him so jacob verse 7 was greatly afraid and distressed when he heard those words what happened to jacob he was terrified he was afraid and notice what he does because he was afraid the same thing that we do I think oftentimes we look at Jacob's life and we think, how can you possibly do that, Jacob? And then we leave church and we do the very same thing Jacob did. But Jacob was afraid and notice what happens. He felt threatened. He felt intimidated. Notice what he was. He was insecure because his confidence was in himself. Now I want you to know, the insecurity that takes place in the life of the Christian always happens when your confidence is in self. When your confidence is in the Lord, you can be bold in the Spirit. So here he's insecure. And he notice not only is he afraid, but he behaves in fear. Now we mentioned last week that anytime when you behave in fear, you're going to make the wrong decision. 
Every single time that you behave in fear, you will be making the wrong decision. You will be making a mistake. And why was he afraid? He was afraid because he was thinking about his past. That's what the enemy always wants to remind you, to make you afraid of what he's calling you to do now. Think about your past. Think about how you ended that season with Esau, how you stole his birthright, how you fooled your dad to making him think that you were him and you weren't him. How you stole the blessing from Esau. He's being reminded of a past season. He's re being reminded of his past failure, and now he is afraid. But he's also afraid because Rebecca, his mother, never sent notice that his brother's anger had passed, as she had told him in Genesis 27. So he had every reason to believe his brother is still mad at him. And he's coming with 400 men. And notice what he does here in verse 8. It says, and he said, if Esau comes to one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. What did he do there in verse 7 and 8? He divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and camels into two companies. He says, if my brother comes and attacks one group, at least the second group can escape. Why? Well, he thought that his brother still was upset with him. He was afraid. Now, Jacob's fear, I want you to know this, was wrong. His fear was wrong because it was followed by when God had given him great deliverance from Laban already. He had no reason to be afraid. He also had no reason to be afraid because God had just affirmed to him through the angels that were encamped around his family's camp that he was with him. Jacob's favor or fear here was wrong because it rose out of the remembrance of his past sins that also was something that he was failing in. You know his attitude should have been here? I pray that Esau comes to me with peace. But if he comes to me with war, I trust God that he will protect me. God has shown himself through these angels that he is with me. I have nothing to be afraid about. How many of us know that when you fear God, you have nothing else to fear? And notice his faith was not fully surrendered. So it says here that he prayed, and Jacob said, notice his prayer. This is his prayer as he prays according to the covenant and the promises of God. It says here, Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac and God who said to me, now, I want you to circle that in your Bible, verse 9, who said to me. This is the first time he prays this way. And in his prayer, he repeats this one more time. But this prayer here was an afterthought. Why was it an afterthought? Because he already divided the group, the, his family into two groups. And now he's going to pray that God delivers him. And that oftentimes is us as well. We find ourselves in a difficult situation. We do everything in our power and strength to make things better. And then after we've done everything we can in our own power and strength to make things better, then we'll say, all right, let's pray now. That is not the attitude to approach situations. We shouldn't say, Lord, these are our plans. Would you now bless them? We should say, Lord, what are your plans? Because we know you're going to bless them. Here he already divided. He already sent messengers. He already tried to impress his brother by his works, by his possession, by his performance, by his accomplishments. And then after everything, he begins to pray. After he already had put a plan together on his own wisdom, at his own plotting, then he calls God to bless us. Now notice his prayer because he's praying the right way, but his heart is not in the right place. Did you know that's possible? that you pray the right way, but your heart is not in the right place. Notice how he prays. He's praying the right way. He said, Lord, you told me. Lord, I trust you because you told me this. This is who you, what you said. He's remembering God's word. This is the way God wants us to pray. God loves it when we pray according to his word, according to his covenant, according to his promises. There's nothing better than when we open the Bible and we say, Lord, according to your word, according to what you have already said, you told me, God, to return to my family's land. Notice what he says this. You told me, return to your country, 
to your family and I will deal well with you. Now he's afraid. He starts to pray this way. You told me to come here, God. You said that you would deal well or kindly with me. Do you see how he's approaching God in this prayer? He's approaching God based off of God's covenant promises. That's how we approach God today, based off the new covenant promises that we have in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, Lord, you told me to do this. You know, God had done this because of his grace on Jacob's life. And Jacob now is praying according to God's word. But know this, when God calls you to do something, God's commandments always involve God's enablements. If God called you to do it, he's also going to empower you to see you through it. If God called you to do it, he will empower you to see you through it. Those are the enablements of God's grace. The will of God will never lead you to a place where his grace and power cannot protect you or provide for you. If God's will for your life is leading you in one direction and you're trusting him by faith, and notice his grace, his power will protect and provide you in that season. You have nothing to fear. Do not doubt God's provision in the will of God. Do not doubt God's power in his will. Do not doubt God's protection in his will. Don't say, well, I'm not going to do this because I can't do blank. Whatever that is, God's going to meet that need. But you know what he's asking for you? Absolute surrender. And he says there in verse 10, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies or all the forgiveness and kindness of all the truth which you have shown your servants. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff. Notice the only thing I had was a staff in my hand and now I have become two companies. He says, I don't deserve God how you have treated me. I don't deserve your unfailing love. I don't have nothing. I am nothing. I crossed over the Jordan on my way over to this land with only a staff in my hand. And I understand it's been your grace, God. I know that, that I've received so much love and favor from you, and it was nothing of myself. I don't deserve it. And notice now I fill two different types of groups in my family. Now notice God's care. Notice God's provision that he is remembering here. And the reason why oftentimes it's important for us to remember what God's done for us, that we would say, Lord, we've seen how you have taken us from one place to the other faithfully, and every single time we think about it, we know it's been you, God. It's been your hand, that God has been faithful in the past, and he'd be faithful to carry us in the future. Lord, I didn't have nothing when I started it was always you. It was your faithful hand. It was your faithful protection. He's play, praying the right way. Notice what he says there in verse 11 as we continue. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. Notice what he's saying. I'm afraid. Why is he afraid? Because he is not depending upon the Lord. He says, Lord, please rescue me. And he's asking, Lord, Lord, please deliver me. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that he's going to attack me, that my family is going to come against me. He's afraid of his brother because he's not fully surrendered to the Lord. And notice how he continues in verse 12 now. For I fear him lest he come attack me and the now mother with the children. For you said. You know what he's doing here again in verse 12? This is the second time he prays this way, according to God's purpose and according to God's promises. Lord, you said this. This is based off of your goodness. This is based off of your word. I I'm taking you at your word now as to what you said. Notice verse 12, I will surely treat you well, and I will make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. This is what you've already told me, God. And now here I am at a crossroads. Here I am at a difficult situation. Here I am at a moment where I'm being tested. This is what you have said. Now, I want you to know something. When God has said something, you know what we need to do? Trust him and obey. God is faithful to his character. 
And God is always faithful to his covenant. What does that mean? That if he said it, he will complete it. If God has said it in his word, if he's confirmed it to us already, notice, he is faithful to what he has said. He doesn't change. He doesn't say something and then take it back. That's not who God is. That, that, is, not, that is against the nature and character of his attributes. In fact, he is faithful to his character. He is faithful to his covenant. It was George Mueller, that great man of faith and missionary, that believed in praying and waiting on God and trusting in God that he would provide, that once was asked, what is the in most important part of prayer? Mr. Mueller, what's the most important part of prayer that you've seen as you've seen God miraculously provide as you've been out in the mission field? You know what he said the most important part of prayer was? He said, the 15 minutes after I have said amen. That's the most important part of prayer. You know what happens after 15 minutes after you've said amen? You really know if you're trusting in God. Because you're either going to wait or you're going to try to scheme. You know what Jacob did here? Jacob's prayer was all in faith. He was saying the right thing. But, but after he prayed, after he said amen, notice he did the wrong thing. Because he, his heart was not in the right place. Notice what happens there in, in verse 13. So he lodged there that same night, and he took what came out of his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. He prayed. He asked God to deliver him. But then he still puts his hand in his pocket. <laughs> How many times have you prayed and you said, Lord, I know you're going to do it. But then what do you do? You still put your hand in your pockets. And the Lord is saying, get your hand out of your pocket. Didn't you say you're going to trust me? Can you stop putting your hand where it doesn't belong? You see, when it comes to trusting in God, we should see, and, and, and seeing the Lord do work in our life, we should see all of the fingerprints of God where we are following him. It shouldn't be the fingerprints of man. It shouldn't be something you forced. It, it shouldn't be something you strive for. It shouldn't be something you scheme. Here you're seeing, notice, he puts his hand in his pocket, you know, and, and finds out what comes out as a present for Esau, his brother. And notice what he's doing here. He's taking from his resources. He's trusting from his possession. He's depending upon what he owns again to gain favor. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams. Notice. 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 fowls. Well, you're really trusting God, right? Notice that extensive list of everything that he's putting together that he owns to try to appease and please his brother. And notice what he says here in verse 16. He delivered them to the hands of his servant every drove by itself and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. He's saying, I want you to go and keep distance between each of you. What does it show here? That as soon as he finished praying... He took up again his own human plan and his own human strategies again. Notice, this is what I'm going to do. Lord, yes, I'm going to pray. I'm going to trust you. And you do what you need to do from up there in heaven, but I'll do what I need to do here. He's getting it in the way. Be careful that you don't get in the way after you pray. That you pray and let God do what God needs to do. That you wait on the Lord, that you trust him. Notice verse 17 as it continues here because it, it demonstrates that he is still leaning on his own understanding. He's still plotting. He still has his own human plan of his own understanding. And he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, they are your servants, Jacob. It's a present. Notice. Sent to my Lord Esau and behold... He also is behind us. And notice how afraid he is. He doesn't even go in the front anymore. He started in the front. Now he's saying, I'm in the back now. And he sends those presents before. And he says, when my brother asks, who are these? Tell him that they are for him as a gift on my behalf, and I'm coming behind you all. So he commanded the second, the third, and all who followed the drove, saying, in this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. Notice different consecutive groups that were coming, all with gifts, to appease his brother. And also say, behold, your servant Jacob is 
behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. You know what the problem is? That he was trying to please his brother instead of trying to please God. What does he say? This is what I'm going to do to please them. I'm going to give him gifts to make him happy. I'm going to give him gifts so that I can be forgiven. I will appease him with gifts that go before him. Notice God's hand was already upon him. He didn't need to do all that. He didn't, do, he didn't need to do all these extra things to try to find favor in God's plan or in God's hand. God's hand was already involved. And it tells him here that he may appease him. So notice, and afterward, verse 20, I will see his faith face perhaps he will accept me you know what he doesn't know what you know what he hasn't learned he hasn't learned grace yet what that means because when we learn grace we know that none of our gifts none of our works none of our performance nothing we do can appease God so that we can be accepted by him we can't please God in our own righteousness we we have to we can't trust in our own ability to make things right or to make things happen apart from trusting in God you know what makes us accepted you know before the Lord is his son Jesus that's the only thing that will appease his righteousness the cross Jesus not anything that we do and he thought if I bring this present that that's going to appease my brother it's not any of our gifts it's not any of our works that appease and make us accepted before the Lord Now, you know why he was had to do this in his own mind? Because he was unable to leave the matters in the hands of God. He could not say, Lord, I leave this in your hands. He was still doubting. He still had unbelief here. He was still striving. He still wanted to be in control. Today, if you want to be in control, you know what we need to do? Let go. Let God be in control. Let the Lord do what he wants to do. So verse 21, so the present went on over before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. He stayed there that night. Notice what happened here, this next section that we read. And he rose that night, and he took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, and he crossed over the fort of Jabbok. And he took them, and he sent them over the brook, and he sent over what he had. Now, he arose that night, and he sent over his family, and he sent over his possessions. But something happens in verse 24 after he sent over his family and his possessions. This is something that God wants for every one of us when he wants to meet with us. And it says, then Jacob was left alone. Would you underline that in your Bible? He was left what? Alone. Oftentimes, God leaves us in a place of isolation so that he can speak to us. He leaves us in a place of isolation because he wants to deal with us as his servants God gets us alone so that he can speak to us and he sent his family he sent his possessions he sent his children and notice what happens after this it says he was left to know and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day this was the first wrestling match in the Bible this is a man wrestled with him Now, if you look in your Bible, the word man is capitalized to give deity. We know different places in Scripture. We see Christ now appear, or a Christophany, through the Old Testament, where he appears through different places of Scripture, and he reveals himself the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, a manifestation of God. And here that man was God himself that wrestled with him. Now, notice... Jacob didn't wrestle with the man. The man wrestled with him. Get get that very straight in your Bible. Notice that. Notate that. Remember that. The man was wrestling with him. And notice what he was wrestling for. Jacob didn't start here by wanting something from God. It, It was God here that came to wrestle with Jacob. God wanted something from him. It wasn't that Jacob needed something from God. God wanted something from Jacob. And you know what he wanted from Jacob? He came to take something. He wanted his proud self-reliance. He wanted all the fleshly scheming from Jacob, all the striving. God came to take it by force. 
Have you ever seen maybe God, oftentimes he says, you need to humble yourself and you refuse to humble yourself. So God has to come and he has to take it by force. And you know what he wants you to do? He wants you to surrender it. But here he was refusing to surrender it. He didn't want to give it up, it's said here. So he had to take it by force if it was necessary. And you see here how that happening in verse 25. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, what does it mean? Did it mean that he could not win against Jacob? No, it, it meant that he, Jacob would not surrender. Jacob was stubborn. He, he would not surrender to God right there. And he was saying, you know what? No, I, I'm not going to surrender to the Lord no matter what happens here. No, no matter what kind of submission God wants to put me in. Have you ever seen wrestling and they practice those submissions? And if you don't want to submit, then, you know, they have you on a headlock, you don't submit, and you just choke out, you get passed out. It's the same thing that was happening here to Jacob. He didn't want to submit. So the Lord had to submit him by force. You see, it's better that you humble yourself than when God has to humble you. And he's learning here that God is humbling him notice he's he's stubborn he's refusing to surrender now that he touched the socket of his hip notice that's all the lord has to do okay you don't want to surrender let me just touch the socket of your hip now it, it didn't say that it was something so forced it is something so uh difficult for the man or for the lord here all he had to do is touch the socket of his hip and the socket of jacob's hip was out of joint or was dislocated as he wrestled with him I think about how that sounds. His hip was dislocated. A very painful thing. God sometimes is dealing with you, and he's dealing with you, and he's dealing with you, and you're saying, I'm not going to surrender. I'm stubborn. I want my way. I don't want your way. And then God says, okay, I, I, enough of this. I'm going to touch the socket of your hip. Very painful what I'm going to have to do with you, but it's necessary. You know what God does? Sometimes he has to break us so that he can make us new again. Sometimes he has to dislocate us so that we submit to him again. Because you know what Jacob was used to doing? He was used to running away. He was used to scheming. He was used to planning. He was used to plotting. And God is saying, you're not going to slow down, so I'm going to touch the socket of your hip now to force you to limp so that you lean on me and you don't lean on your own understanding anymore. Notice what happens here. He was stubborn. He was reckless. God had to do something to get his attention. He will do whatever it takes to get your attention. It's going to be painful sometimes. You know what he does? He wants to take your little plans that you think, these are my plans. I'm going to touch your hip right now if you don't surrender those plans. <laughs> If you don't surrender that pride, that self-sufficiency, the self-reliance. This is a very invaluable place for us to come to as Christians where God conquers us and then he rules over our lives. Before you can conquer anything in life, you know, you, you know what you need to do? You need to be conquered by God. You need to let him say, Lord, I, I surrender, I tap out. You win, God. Because then he'll touch the socket of your hip and he'll dislocate so that he can conquer you. A.W. Tozer said it this way, the Lord cannot fully bless a man until he has first conquered him. You want to be blessed? Have you been conquered by God already? Are you still following God but doing your little side thing over here? Notice here, he, he was being conquered by the Lord here. He had no option. He could not run away now he, like he was used to. He went from wrestling to having to rest. God is saying, just rest, just rest, just wait on me, just rest, and you want to wrestle. <laughs> he went from wrestling to then resting. You see, God meets us so graciously in our hour of need. Whatever level he finds us in, whatever level he finds you in, then he deals with us and lifts us up to the place where we need to be. You know what the place that we need to be is? when we're depending and leaning on him. Not on yourself. Not when you think you got it, because you don't have it. Not when you're so presumptuous or proudful. God will touch the socket of your hip real quick. Notice what happens here. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. The man says, okay, I'm done with you. 
But notice what he says. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now Jacob wants something. But you know what's awesome? That now that God's dealt with him, now he had to rely on God to give him the blessing instead of trying to take it by his own cleverness. Do you see here now he's asking God for his blessing instead of saying, I know how to get it on my own? Now he's cleaning, clinging on to God. He was crippled, so what did he have to do? Cling. To the point where the man said, let go of me now. <laughs> and he said, I'm not going to let go. I'm clinging now because I need to be supported until you bless me. That's the very place where God wants us. But we're saying, Lord, I'm just holding on. I'm not letting go until you bless me now. Well, we learn what it means to depend upon him. And you know what happens here? What the Lord asks him now, he says, the Lord asked him, he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He wanted to, him to admit his name. <laughs> what does the name Jacob mean? Deceiver. I want you to admit, I want you to know who you are. I want you to admit it. You, you can't cover it up now, Jacob. Because in this case, notice in his case, it, it was a reflection of his true nature. And he's saying, I, I know what they call you, but I want you to realize who you really are. You've been a deceiver and you need to admit this. This goes here from not only a dislocation, but then an identification. Look at the identification. He says, I want you to identify under a new name now. You know what happens here when God deals with us? You know when God has dealt with a person because there's a transformation. There not only is a wrestling, there's not only a submission, there's not only an identification, but there's a, a transformation that happens here. That Jacob is broken so that he can lean on the Lord, that he can make him new again. That's the real blessing. When we say, Lord, bless me, you know what he's going to say? Then surrender absolutely. That's where the blessing comes from. And notice, and he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. You know what Israel means? Governed by God. I'm changing your name because I'm changing you. Now you're governed by God. Now you're not striving. Now you're not wrestling. Now you're not fighting. Stop fighting me. Just surrender now. And it said, Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. What does it mean that you have prevailed? That you have learned what it means to truly surrender. You have learned, and you have learned the hard way. Sometimes we have to learn the hard way. Sometimes we have to learn a way that's very painful. But God will do whatever it takes so that we can get to that place. The place that we're holding on to the Lord and saying, Lord, would you just bless me? The place where he says, I have to dislocate this so that you learn to not lean on yourself, but to lean on me. How many times has God blessed us with possessions, with things, with family, with open doors, and then we start running so strong, so reckless in our now lust, in our ambition, in our flesh, and we get in trouble because we forget about the Lord. You know what the Lord says? All right, I'm going to remove your family. I'm going to remove your kids. I'm going to deal with you by yourself now. And when he deals with us, you know what we need to do? We need to say, Lord, I surrender everything. Because he will touch the socket of that hip. He will dislocate what he needs to. So you learn once and for all what it means to lean on him. This is a place of special testing and blessing. It's intense pain. But you know what it produces? Blessing. You know what the pain produces in your life when you're walking with the Lord? It produces the blessing of you learning to depend upon him. Notice what he calls the place here now. And Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you asked me of my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. You know what he called it? The face of God, that place. I have a revelation of God right here. He's crippled and he's clinging onto the Lord. He said, this is the place where I can see the face of God. This is the place where I surrender to the Lord. And just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Think about that. He left limping. 
You know what that taught him? That he no longer can run. You know what God did for him? He slowed him down. God will do whatever he needs to to slow you down so that you don't trust yourself, so that you don't trust people. You know who you need to trust? Trust in the Lord. Trust in Jesus. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip of the socket, because he, because he God, touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the, and the muscle that shrank. God will deal with us by his grace. God will do whatever he needs to so that we absolutely surrender to him. He doesn't only want confession. You know what he wants? Conversion. Is there a transformation? Is there an absolute surrender of your life? Let's pray.